This is a dark age, a bloody age, an age of demons and of sorcery. It is an age of battle and death and of the world's ending. Amidst all of the fire, flame and fury, it is a time too of mighty heroes, of bold deeds and great courage. At the heart of the old world sprawls the empire, the largest and most powerful of the human realms, known for its engineers, sorcerers, traders and soldiers. It is a land of great mountains, mighty rivers, dark forests and vast cities. And from its throne in Oldorf reigns the Emperor Karl Franz, sacred descendant of the founder of these lands, Sigmar, and wielder of his magical warhammer. But these are far from civilized times. Across the length and breadth of the old world, from the knightly palaces of Bretonia to icebound Kislev in the far north, come rumblings of war. In the towering world's edge mountains, the orc tribes are gathering for another assault. Bandits and renegades harry the wild southern lands of the border princes. There are rumors of rat things, the Skaven, emerging from the sewers and swamps across the land. And from the northern wilderness, there is the ever-present threat of chaos, of demons and beastmen corrupted by the foul powers of the dark gods. As the time of battle draws ever nearer, the Empire needs heroes like never before. Sun-kissed copper mountains and deep summery dales surrounded King Belagar and his throng as they marched. The Darwi of the Angrand realm had been mustered for a conquest of reclamation. The army numbered in the hundreds, with stalwart warriors, pickaxe-hefting miners, and embittered rangers from the raided farms in the surrounding area. Good names followed the clans at Belagar's command, but the most esteemed were the hammer-bearing elite of his own bodyguard, the Iron Brotherhood. Volunteers from across the world, an elite unmatched in the field, wielding weapons made from the precious dwarven metal Grumriel, forged in the long-lost city of Karagagnax. Halt the column! Ark and Groby filth ahead, infesting the valley. They bear the red lightning bolt of the Broken Nose tribe. They're filthy raiders that have plundered our home for far too long. Rally now and move with haste. We will catch them unawares. Our rangers will lure them into the hills where we will make short work of them. the rest of them. As had happened countless battles before, the hapless greenskin savages blundered forward, bellowing and swinging their crude weapons. The leader was a hulking thing, a bear mother of warfare, and from his girdle dangled beards and braids as petty trophies. Belagar spied him out amongst the manifold beasts and swept for him, hammer in hand. The front lines crashed together as an ocean of green breaking upon a shore of boulders. The dwarfs withstood the onslaught in their tightly packed formation, apart from those that were flung into the air to be trampled underfoot. Bastard filth! I see you! <laughs> Not bad! Almost a shame you don't get to see the big surprise we've left for you. <laughs> what surprise? Speak up and I will make your death quick. A 
As the iron monstrosity came for him, Belagar let the chopper's hefty blow glance off his shield before driving it into the midriff of the warboss. The great orc staggered, grunted, whined, and as it saw its forces dispersing, it was gripped by the faithless cowardice of his race and turned tail. Quarrels thudded into the fleeing orcs and goblins as they fled, and whilst cheers were had, this was only a meager beginning. Scouts had already reported of an even larger force ahead, occupying the dwarven settlement of Karak Bovdar. The dead and wounded were collected, and due to the speed with which Belagar decided to move, there was no time for embalming any of the bodies for later entombment. Pale and dour priest of Gasul, the dwarven ancestor god of the dead, remained behind to raise primitive currents for the fallen, despite of much protestation from those still alive they forsook. For there were, were few, save the priestesses of Valaya, able to tend to wounds as they. Pressing on through the night, the throng reached the outskirts of Karak Bovdar, though when the forward scout returned to their king, they held a sickly pallor and a distant hatred to their eyes. My king, the orcs are encamped just outside of the breach gates of the hold. They are feasting. Feasting? Any sight of their leader? Nay, my king. It must have skidded off further down the valley with what remained of his warband. We move. There may yet be some there were none, my king. There was a grim surety to the old ranger's mien, one that spoke of both grief and anger, to have witnessed butchery with nothing but inaction. Belagar had rest a hand upon the old dwarf's shoulder, knowing there was little to do to soothe the turmoil in his friend's heart. Only axe work would do. As morning grew, a pitched battle was at hand, with but few words spoken. Either side held numbers and warriors for an honest exchange of violence, but the Greenskin underestimated the cold fury of the Dwarfs that day. Howling goblin wolf riders emerged in the flanks of the Greenskin forces, eager to deal death to the exposed miners of Belagar's outmost positions. But they and their flea-bitten dogs met their end at the edge of human pickaxe. Victory was secured, though they had arrived too late to save any of the inhabitants of the dwarven town. Scraps of clothing lay discarded amongst the orcish camps as they rifled through it for valuables, and what bones of Darwi could be found were stored in a great chest for the priest of Gasul to bestow their rights upon when they returned. Karak Bovdar was a dwarven lumberer town with but a small stone garrison built into the side of the mountain, which led into deep tunnels and homes homes that no doubt had been breached and emptied for the orcs' feast. Days passed while the town was being cleansed and repaired, and the army had to encamp in tents outside of the ruins. As Belagar went to rest in his tent, he lay upon his cot yet wearing a shirt of Gromril and with his hammered hand. It was unnatural for a dwarf to bunk out here in the open, and he preferred an honest cavern compared to the field. Still was a freshness to the air that bore the scent of his childhood, and the crackling of fire and muttering of his bodyguards brought his mind to ease. A cold rose within the tent, and not a sound seemed to exist as Belagar awoke. It was dark, save for the stars managing to leer through the slightest slit of the canvas. The ghastly sensation of an unnatural presence took hold of the king, yet he could not move, and slowly the spilling of turquoise light funneled into the tent, as the sun reflected upon a mirror of ice. A figure stood there, mighty in its Gromril forge glory, a chest plate emblazoned with a hammer, and the great white beard thrice bound into his girdle. It was a kingly figure, one which Belagar recognized, though it had been almost a thousand years since he had seen the stern visage of his father. Belagar, how am I yet to haunt this world, and not find peace in the stone? A failure of a son? 
is what I have been damned with. Belagar could not stir nor speak. He was bound to behold the terrible spectre. The king of nothing. Blot in the other ways. It must be ours once more. The queen of the silver depths, my son. Do not fail your people as I have. A terrible anguish befell Belagar to have been admonished by the ghost of his ancestors in such a manner. The whether it had been a dream or a true vision he could not tell, for sleep took a hold of him soon after. Though the words lingered even then, the Queen of the Silver Depths, Carrick Eight Peaks. <laughs>